Hello. Um, we have finished the lecture on broadcast receivers. Um, so this will be the continuation of the Android platform components and the main core concepts that uh, allow us to program on Android. So just a quick wrap up. We were discussing broadcast receivers and the system events that can be advertised and then using a broadcast receiver allows you to hook up to some of those advertised uh, events, system events like battery being low or you know picture just being captured uh, and also advertise your own events to add any other activities uh, or services and the broadcast receivers don't have any UI but you can use the status bar um, notifications using the, the system notification bar at the top. All right, um, we have discussed that any application can start another application by using intents and you can do that using a start activity or start service and you pass the uh, intent of what you are intending to start and through the intent you can pass the parameters to the newly activated activity. Um, it's very flexible mechanism and because of that the launcher which launches your application also uses intent to actually launch it and therefore there is no sort of single entry point to application there is no main function you basically declare which activities out of all activities that you have in your .apk file have the ability to be launched by the launcher so typically your application will have one, like one main activity that shows up as an icon on, on your desktop of the uh, Android device and then the launcher will launch that but you can have multiple so your application may have multiple entry points and then each of those will have an icon on the, on the desktop on, on, on the, of the Android device and then the launcher can launch the one which the user clicks, taps twice. So this is kind of an interesting uh, difference between iOS and Android that on iOS we have a traditional main based entry point to the application, a single point of entry, whereas on Android we have, um, we don't have that, we have a more flexible mechanism. Um, we have discussed this a little bit before uh, in the class that you may launch different activities or services within the same process or with a different within a different process and you declare it in the manifest file so if you launch uh, two activities or activity and a service in the same process then uh, they will be jointly shut down by android or if you launch them separately they can sort of uh, continue to run independently from each other uh, one of the side effects of launching something in a separate process is that it actually launches the entire JVM in a different process and some static components that we typically use in Java programming for passing parameters between one class or the other doesn't work anymore because they actually live in different processes so a static field of one class is not the same as a static field of another class in another JVM. So you have to use those um, message passing uh, properties of activities intents to pass parameters and you cannot use the simple static mechanisms of your Java programming. We can discuss it in the, in the next laboratory so I can show you exactly what, what is meant by that. And the final point is that the content providers are not activated I mean they just passively provide data so anytime you need the data from a content provider you just instantiate instantiate it and access it you don't need to uh, activate it by saying start content provider uh, like you do with activities and services um, so on Tuesday you will work with uh, some of the um, life cycles life cycle um, stages of the activity and we've already did start activity uh, and you're supposed to try out start activity for result and passing some parameters back to the calling activity that's the task for Tuesday uh, you can also try out some of the properties of the services 
Um, they often come handy, as we were discussing, for running uh, long-lasting um, tasks uh, in the background for the user. If you're doing something with data or data sort of rich content applications, then you may want to try out something uh, with the content providers and content resolvers, but those are kind of advanced topics, so you may you may skip that. Uh, same with the broadcasts. You may uh, register a broadcast, for example, for battery or, or some of the system events, or you can try to register a broadcast for your own broadcasts, and then you send broadcasts to advertise something, um, to wake up some other activity that will then react to your event. But those are optional. But do try uh, activity for result and, and services. They tend to be useful for the assignment three for um, building a more complex uh, applications. All right. Um, you will have to um, generate and edit and modify the manifest file. And it is useful to know what's there and what parameters you can use. Um, Android Studio has a nice GUI editor which allows you to pick the fields and select from the options. Um, you can edit the XML file manually in a text editor. Um, check out the specs from the Google developers pages of what's there. Uh, what permissions do you need? If you want to use, um, if you want to write to SD card, you have to enable the permissions. If you want to use maps, you have to enable a certain uh, API levels and uh, access to Google libraries. If you want to use OpenGL, you have to do the same. So there is a, a lot of cases where you have to manually update and provide details of what you really need in the manifest file. Um, so I will not go over you know, all the details here. You check the uh, specification and check what you need. Or you can ask me or Bjorn uh, if your app is complaining that you are trying to do something but you don't have access to that. Um, the most important thing is that you have to specify the minimum um, Java uh, or Google Android um, API level that your software uses. Therefore, the compiler can verify that you don't use something that is not provided. And also, the deploying um, process can check if the phone has sufficient API level. So um, that's usually done for you when you're generating the skeleton for the app. But then you can, as we were discussing in the lecture, you can set up the level a little bit higher because we're not really producing you know, deployable applications here. We just are learning how to, how to do programming. And using the modern APIs typically is a little bit easier than supporting multiple uh, versions. You have to declare whether you are using camera or whatever. You can use the modern API and do those checks and those requests in the code, or you can declare it in the old-fashioned way in the XML file, for in, in the manifest file. Uh, so there are two ways of accessing sensors and accessing the facilities of the phone. Um, one is the old way of declaring them in the manifest file, and then the user, when installing the app, is presented with the long list of things that this app uses and has to agree um, to the application being able to access that. Or you can postpone that check to runtime and allow a user to install an app without agreeing to any permissions up front. And then when, do, when you need to use the camera, then you will uh, request access to the camera and the uh, Android runtime will remember the choice the user made. So if the user granted the permission, um, then you can uh, access the camera. And then if the user doesn't grant you the permission, then you have to work around it in your application. So you have to do some runtime checking whether you have access to the camera or not. Um, I propose using the modern way of accessing the, the sensors and services like camera. But the old, old way is a little bit easier because you just declare it in the, um, in the manifest file. So it's up to you. But you should be aware of, of those two mechanisms for um, specifying the requirements and the permissions. Um, you, can, um, 
You can chain the applications as we were discussing in the lecture before. And what we mean here is that you can pass the control to, say, Google Maps app or a browser directly from your own application. But then your application is being put on hold, as we were discussing in the life cycle of the applications. So it is important that you um, make sure that when the proper order of uh, on pause and on resume is called, you kind of restore the state of your application. And you also have to consider the possibility of your application being wiped out by the Android runtime system, in which case you can persistently store some of the state of your application to you know, persistent storage like a, like a disk and then read from it to restore the state where the app was. So let's imagine a scenario where you're typing a note and then you want to look up a location. So you go to a Google Maps to uh, select like uh, coordinates of some, of some place which you would like to in include, embed in your note. Uh, and then you move the application uh, you move out of your application to the Google Maps to do the search. And then once the selection is done, you go back to your application. Um, and in the meantime, your application was swiped from the, uh, swapped from the memory. Uh, then the user would lose the note they were editing. So it's important to save that note in persistent storage. So when their application is restored, the note is restored as well. So you have to remember that Android runtime can kill your application at any time, depending on what is happening with the memory or uh, resources the runtime has. Um, so then you have to save the state and restore it. Uh, it's very easy because uh, there are mechanisms which are, again, uh, helping you to do that. And the state is basically stored in a bundle, same as you're passing the extras through the intent, you can store the state in a bundle and then restore it uh, on demand. So there are two API calls that you're using for saving and restoring the state. Uh, you can try it out in the lab as well. Um, all right. We will uh, talk about location services and location manager later on. So I will skip that uh, slide here. Uh, we will talk about user interfaces in the following lecture. So we can skip that as well. Um, and then there are some uh, tutorials, and I'm posting some of the tutorials on the Piazza as well, so you can follow those. If you find some links or some inaccuracies in the slides, please let me know, and I will fix it. All right, um, the final thing is to use, um, you know, other people code and examples. Uh, as we were discussing, it's fine. Uh, make sure that you understand it. If you don't, just ask for us to explain it. Uh, there might be some, you know, awkward ways of doing some things which can be fixed or done more efficiently. Or there might be some snippets of code that you don't fully understand how it works. And then Bjorn or I will explain, explain it to you. So, you know, use um, GitHub or Bitbucket repositories, ask questions on uh, or search questions on uh, Stack Overflow and make sure that you do understand the, uh, the code. All right, so I will stop here. Um, there are some uh, tutorials that I've done previously uh, with the OpenCV library. We will do it in one of the labs. Um, so I will come back to this, to this slide. If you want to do something with OpenCV, like, which is an image library for tracking um, some objects in the camera view or doing some augmented reality applications, then follow the tutorials and the uh, blog post how to set up the Android Studio with OpenCV. It, it is a little bit dated. I've, re, uh, re, um, I've updated it last year, uh, but I will do another update before we will do a lap on OpenCV. So uh, there might be some inconsistencies to the latest versions. All right, so that's, um, that's it for, for this lecture, which is finishing the previous lecture on the Android as a platform. Um, if you have any questions, post them on Piazza. Thank you.